I am currently uh, at NIAMS at the NIH, um, but uh, in two weeks we'll be moving to start a lab in Pittsburgh. So uh, I suppose, let's see if this works. Super. So thanks, Ed, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so I, I, I consider 18 to be the other inflammasome cytokine because so much research and discussion is focused on IL-1 and the efficacy of IL-1 has almost defined the field of autoinflammation for many years. So let's talk about the other one. So uh, for those who don't sort of live, breathe, and eat the inflammasome, when I think about the inflammasome, I don't know if there's a pointer on here or not. Um, ah, all right. So, so I think of the inflammasome as basically having three subunits. There's a nucleator, uh, a small number of molecules, 10 to 20, uh, that can sort of kick this all off. And this is where uh, the goodness or badness, depending on your perspective, begins. And the, the nucleators I'm going to discuss are pyrin, NLRP3, and NLRC4, NLRP3 pictured here. And then that, once those sort of get activated and aggregate, nucleates this uh, adapter called ASK. And then you get sort of this exponential uh, filamentous growth of ASK. And my point here is to say a small number of nucleator molecules can then activate a massive number of adapter molecules, which then recruit and activate a massive, massive number of effector molecules, a protease, in this case, caspase-1. And so this massive complex that goes from a few activated molecules to something that is the size of like an organelle within a cell all happens very quickly. And obviously it's there for host defense, but that's not what we're talking about. So once that, that inflammasome is, is nucleated, what does it do? It takes these substrates, pro-IL-18, pro-IL-1 beta, and, and we now know something called gastrin D, and it cleaves them to their activated forms. And IL-1 beta and IL-18 go on to do the inflammatory signaling that Ed mentioned, and we now know that the N-terminus of gastrin D helps induce pores and induces this inflammatory cell death. So this is the inflammasome. And we already know through the work of, of basically the giants on whose shoulders I stand about inflammasome-induced diseases, uh, inflammasomopathies, if you will. And so the, the first characterized, although we didn't know much about the mechanism until very recently, was familial Mediterranean fever. Um, and then later were the cryopyranopathies, and this actually ends up being a spectrum of disease. And then um, we were lucky enough to sort of stumble along at the same time that, that the Yale group then by uh, Neil Romberg, uh, the, what I'm calling NLRC4-opathies. I'm no longer calling it NLRC4-MAS because we know more about the spectrum of disease uh, through some beautiful work coming out of the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> so, but there's some really salient differences that I'm going to harp on. Um, so they, they all... Um, can have rash, and so FMF gets this erysipelas-like rash, and when you biopsy it, it's full of neutrophils. The cryopyranopathies, they get urticaria, and just to talk a bit about urticaria, not all that is urticaria is allergic. Um, in fact, practically anything, when you biopsy it, can cause urticaria. It's, it's, it's quite frustrating from a clinical standpoint, because just looking at the skin, you often have no idea what's happening beneath the surface. But in this case, in the cryopyranopathies, those urticaria are full of neutrophils, but in the NLRC4-opathies, we recently found out through uh, some group out of Eus uh, group that actually their urticaria, and I didn't show a picture, but their classic hives is full of lymphohistiocytic subdermal infiltrate, not neutrophils, but lymphocytes and activated macrophages. So there are complications, and I'm not going to read to a literate audience, uh, and Ed just talked about uh, in the NLRC4-opathies that IL-18 might be, at least in N1, a target. So what can we use to distinguish these inflammasomopathies, right? They all induce the same inflammasome, the same inflammasome that can cleave IL-1 and IL-18, but we don't see IL-18 equally in the inflammasomopathies. Uh, in FMF, it's marginally elevated. In the cryopyranopathies, it's a little bit more marginally. But in NLRC4 patients, it's, it's stratospherically elevated. And if you include even the NLRC4 patients that don't have MAS, it's still on that level it's a different scale, it's a different assay, but if you sort of make the conversion, you know, this would end up being somewhere around here, just another order of magnitude, what we see in other inflammasome activating. Is that three or four? This is total. So we're just talking about biomarkers here. Uh, and so looking at IL-18 across a just sort of a brutally broad auto-inflammatory cohort, which is what we're fortunate to have uh, at the NIH, Basically, if you draw a line, and this is, oh, geez, a log, a log scale, 
If you are red, you have or have had MAS. And many of the parents in this room, if you like later, I will point to your child's line. You're up here at you know, close to 100,000 picograms per ml of IL-18. Everyone else in the autoinflammatory world, and here are sort of some of the diseases that, that we've measured, is down here, either in the normal range or in the sort of what I call bland range. And we do have a few patients with FHL here. This is malignancy and associated FH, uh, uh, HLH, and this is primary HLH, and we have some more data on that I'll show in a second. Uh, this is just to show that the IL-18 that we're measuring in the serum, it's cleaved. If you IP it from the serum, which you need a lot of serum from a little baby to do, uh, it runs at the same molecular weight as recombinant IL-18. But uh, as Ed mentioned, you know, if you, this is free IL-18, and this is basically the same sort of uh, uh, rubric of, of, you know, red. Um, those that have any free IL-18 that's measurable, are basically in this group here. So you have to have really quite high levels of IL-18 circulating to have any free IL-18. So this is some data uh, that we generated recently using uh, a well-described cohort from Dirk Holzinger's group, uh, where they basically have what they characterize as active disease, and I don't have a lot of details about you know, each individual patient's ferritin CRP, but basically, you know, again, you see the same thing, even in primary HLH patients, that they have what I would consider fairly ho-hum, not normal, IL-18 elevation. And I will tell you that they don't have free IL-18. Uh, and we can geek out about IL-18 versus IL-18 binding protein and what induces them differentially. But your MAS patients and your systemic GIA patients that don't meet criteria for MAS are sort of in another league. And what's kind of interesting is this sort of heterogeneous group that was called infection-associated HLH seems to sort of fall into two dimorphic patterns, which may be useful. So why IL-18 and why MAS? Why, what is sort of shunting it into this group of patients that have MAS, uh, and, and, and why is the IL-18 elevated at all? So, so here I'm going to engage in some sort of circumstantial evidence. And so this is stolen from, not stolen, but extracted from Imgen. These are human immune cells. And this is just the transcript level of IL-18 versus IL-1 beta. And in immune cells, particularly macrophages and neutrophils, there's the, the amount of IL-18 at the transcript level is dwarfed by IL-1 beta. Uh, and this is inflammasome expression. Now, this is mouse. But likewise, the inflammasomes that we were associating with neutrophilic skin rashes are much higher in, these are macrophages in blue, these are neutrophils in sort of reddish pink, compared to the NLRC4 expression. Now again, this is microarray, so it's different probes, and we're working on doing this with RNA-seq. But the point here is to say, you know, it, it could be just circumstantial that the inflammasomes that are activated in immune cells are NLRP3 and pyrin inflammasomes, and the substrate that's available is IL-1-beta, not IL-18. But if you look in the tissues, it's a totally different story. If you just take a mouse tissue and you grind it up and you look at the transcript levels for IL-1-beta versus IL-18, now IL-1-beta is the loser. There's tons of IL-18 in the tissues, in the trachea, in the skin, in stomach, and in large and small intestine. In epithelial mucosal barrier surfaces, there's a ton of IL-18 message. And so we went into GEO, which is the gene expression omnibus, and we've sort of tried to rigorously sort of uh, take RNA-seq data, which are a bit more comparable from one gene to the next, uh, and, and pull out that there are certain tissue areas where this sort of circumstantial overlap really exists. So in intestinal epithelial cells, the amount of NLRC4 is much higher than MEFE and NLRP3. There's plenty of inflammasome components, and there's plenty of IL-18, especially over IL-1-beta. Likewise, human keratinocytes, we see the same thing. And so we said, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe IL-18 is not you know, an immune cell phenomenon. And what do we mean by immune cells? When we talk about non-immune cells, we're sort of excluding a whole bunch of cells that actually have a really important role in the immune response. So we, uh, maybe about eight months ago, made a mouse that has a gain-of-function mutation in NLRC4. This is actually 
uh, it's not violating HIPAA. This is the mutation that Claire has. Uh, and the genes are so homologous that it was actually the same amino acid at the same position. And we made that substitution. And that mouse, over multiple founders and multiple generations, overproduces IL-18. But where does that IL-18 come from? Well, this is complicated. And, and I'm just going to sort of, we'll talk about the data later, but take my word for it. Basically, that's very Trumpian of me. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> If your immune system was NLRC4 hyperactive, it didn't do anything to your IL-18. But if your non-immune, non-hematopoietic cells were from an NLRC4 knock, and it didn't matter which immune system you had, if we gave that mouse a normal immune system, it still made tons of extra IL-18. And that fits with some of the observations that we're seeing in some of the patients who really have had MAS after MAS after MAS. And again, some of your, your beloved are, are pictured here as well. So in red is the level of IL-18. The little red dot is normal, the, the, the dotted line up here. And this is years. So in a patient with Stills disease, over years and multiple flares of MAS, her IL-18 sort of is at near a set point. This is a patient that had no mid-like disease, no identical NLRP3 mutation, bony overgrowth of the knees. And unlike every other CAPS patient I showed you, her IL-18 is stratospheric, and it's stratospheric for eight years. This is long after she gets on IL-1 inhibition, and she's doing great. Um, and these are both NLRC4 patients, who we know have sort of long-standing chronic IL-18 levels. So the IL-18 is not a disease activity marker, and we don't know whether it precedes disease. But it certainly exists at these very high levels long after disease has, has sort of gone down a bit. Uh, sure. So long ago, there was a paper about um, IL-18 in bone marrow cells. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what I'm talking about? I, and I'm just wondering whether the, there, I can't remember exactly how they did that. They were looking for who's making the IL-18. I've got a slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I th I, was that by immunohistochemistry, though? Yes. Well, the immunohistochemistry was made on the child. Right. Yeah. So, so the... Yeah. So, so the immunohistochemistry for IL-18 is lovely, but it, it lights up pro-IL-18. So it doesn't tell you what's active, and it certainly doesn't tell you what is free from IL-18 binding protein. So, so oh, IL-18 binding protein itself. Do you know what cells produce and what kinds of stimuli? So, so um, Chem Gabay is actually making IL-18 IL-18 binding protein flocks to mice. We don't know, and and actually, I think it's going to be sort of all of the above. Uh, from what you can tell from sort of uh, the circumstantial sort of imgen type da data, cells that are able to make, cells that are able to respond to interferon gamma, which is pretty much everyone, are capable of upregulating IL-18 binding protein. It is considered as a typical interferon gamma Right. It's a very... It makes sense if it is a feedback, a regulatory feedback mechanism, it makes sense. So, so just to show but some data... So in Dirk Holtzinger's cohort, if you do an ROC curve of the ratio of total IL-18 to either IL-18 binding protein or to CXCL9, you can, with greater than 80% sensitivity and almost 100% specificity, differentiate what was diagnosed as MAS versus FHL. Which is something that we sort of already knew, but it's not something that we're necessarily measuring. And so, you know, I think that the dynamics of these two, and this is where the biomarker comes in, and when you have larger number of samples and you look at them longitudinally, they can be quite instructive, especially in relation to each other. So just to summarize, because I'm sure I've gone over, IL-18 is a pretty good biomarker. Um, it's really stable. Uh, it's, wow, thank you. It says I have one minute. It's very stable. It has a huge dynamic range in serum or plasma. It's pretty easy to measure. I can do it. And it's not particularly variable in these patients, uh, varying with disease activity. Pound for pound, there's, excuse me, there's a ton more IL-18 in non-hematopoietic cells. In some non-hematopoietic NLRC4 cells, uh, NLRC4 is greater in non-hematopoietic cells than other inflammasome nucleators. But NLRC4, I'm, I'm only showing you three of the inflammasome nucleators. We haven't talked about NLRP6 or NLRP1. There are other inflammasome nucleators that we don't pay as much attention to clinically because we don't have a monogenic association with. 
but it's entirely possible that what we're seeing in the IL-18 high patients who we don't have an LRC4 mutation is dysregulation of some non-hematopoietic inflammasome. We just need to get smarter about finding it. And as I mentioned in a mouse with an LRC4 mutation, it has extra IL-18 that seems to come from non-hematopoietic cells. Uh, the sources in IL-18 in people are much less clear, and I don't want to say that just because it seems to be non-hematopoietic in our mouse doesn't mean that, not, that hematopoietic production of IL-18 in people is not important, particularly when we see these sort of array of histiocytes on biopsy. But I would doubt that those histiocytes are still there in such presence and making all that IL-18 in someone eight years after their last flare. And so, you know, I think the old scientific paradigm of garbage in equals garbage out is really important and goes back to, I think, one of uh, uh, Eric Hoffman's points last night, which is that as much as we do need to sort of come up with innovative and novel ways of assessing small groups of heterogeneous patients, we cannot walk away from rigor. Because when we lose rigor, we shoot ourselves in the foot. We approve drugs that we're not confident that they work, and then insurers challenge us on that. So we need to maintain the level of rigor that we would have and has been the benchmark for more common diseases, but be creative about sort of uh, uh, believing the differences that we see in the trials that we design. Uh, I think you know, we've beaten the heterogeneity horse to death. Uh, and I would say that one of the other things that I, I've taken away from Eric's work is that the order of operations here seems to be that strong research networks precede strong enrollment and then ultimately lead to strong medicine. So I've probably gone over a little bit, but thanks very much.